Well, I was always ambitious. I was never, uh, I mean, at school, I was not successful at all, really. You know, I left with one grade E A level. And my maths teacher saw me in a pub years later, said he still quoted me as why not to give up at the, the mocks because miracles can happen. I left and became a training manager at Marks and Spencer, which was a horrible job. And then I got a job in local newspapers. And in my mid twenties, I went to university, which really is what changed my life, I think. Yes, you went to university as a, as a mature student. Um, were you active in student politics at university? Yeah, on and off. I was vice president of something or other for, for a while and the rest of it. Were you um, a student radical? I went to university thinking I was, I'd always been accused of being on the left. And of course, you ended up at university where I was probably moderate. Because uh, in those days, you know, you had the International Socialists and the International Marxist group and the rest of it. I mean, interestingly, um, Peter Hitchens mm. was at York when I was there as a, as a far left Trotskyist, really. How did you Which, find those far left Trotskyists? How did you, you know, when you, when you encountered them at university? I always thought they were deeply suspect, actually. <laughs> I always thought that... I mean, a lot of them were good public school boys who were playing a game, but they were so aggressive and unpleasant to everybody, including themselves. So I always found, I've always found the far left difficult, which is why, you know, which is why I would have had nothing to do with Corbyn in recent years. Tell us the first election that you voted in and how you voted. The first election I went to, but I wasn't voting because I don't think you could vote in those days at 18. At 18. I went to, I was brought up in, Hayes in Middlesex and I was, went to the grammar school there and I remember going to the 19, I don't know, 64 election to the count because our head, there was being counted at our school and our headmaster offered six of us the opportunity to go to the count. So I went to the count there. How was that? Kind of, Long? Well, it's like, oh, well, except it was so overwhelmingly Labour Hayes in those yeah. days. It was a pretty foregone conclusion. But that was the first one I went to. And the first one I I did any work in was, I think, 66, when I went and volunteered for the Labour Party. I wasn't a member of the Labour Party, but I went and volunteered for the Labour Party. It's, it was when I first discovered what a shambles um, canvassing and getting people out is. Uh, <laughs> and it doesn't seem to me that much better today, really. Did you continue I mean, to be an activist? In a recent local election, my wife was standing for the Lib Dems in the council, so I went out my car and tried to take people to the polls only to discover that of the people the Liberals had given me all bar one were voting Tory. <laughs> and yeah you have to do some good voter ID before you you make that promise yeah. to do the lifts don't you? <laughs> my mother always said that my grandfather who was a good working class Tory always told them he was Labour because he took the Labour car <laughs> so he could vote Tory. So what do you think in 1966 you start volunteering for the Labour Party why? I always saw myself as uh, left of centre. And at that time, I think we saw Howard Wilson as a progressive force. And I was always quite a political animal. So I decided I'd go and, and I was I was working in the Uxbridge constitu constituency at that time, which is now, of course, Boris's. Are you a socialist? Were you a socialist? No, I don't think so. I define myself as, um, I mean, today, what, what would I define myself as? As um, a left of centre libertarian, which is a very strange position to be in, you know, that I actually think you want to control how much government interviews or intervenes in all our lives. But I am a view that um, we need to support and help those at difficult times of their lives. I read that you got a traineeship at the Mirror. But it wasn't the Daily Mirror, it was called the Hillingdon Mirror. Ah, right. It was the lo a local weekly paper. And I'd, I'd left Marks and Spencer's. I didn't have a job and I started thinking, what would I like to do? And I walked into their office and I thought I'd be at home here. It just felt right. And I talked to them and then I went away and six months later they rang me up and offered me a job. But I also read that you launched or initiated a strike over pay and conditions. Is that, is that right, what I read? Well, we discovered we were all junior reporters and there were no senior reporters there were only junior reporters everybody was an indentured junior it was when they started to pay we discovered that we were earning less money than the teleag girls that we all decided this wasn't right the conditions were pretty awful 
Uh, I mean, for instance, when, when I got the job, you had to buy your own typewriter. I mean, such was life in those days. I, I did organize all the junior reporters right across the whole group, which ran from Shepherd's Bush out to Buckinghamshire, a protest against the management. Now, I'll, I'll never forget, it was a wonderful man called Laraman, who was the chief executive, uh, who was the, ch yes, he was the chief executive of the whole group, who basically said to us, there's no point in giving you more money because you'll spend it on portable radios. Oh, but so he was of another era, completely <laughs> different, you know, different sort of perspective on life. And after that, I got involved with the National Union of Journalists for a few years. When you became a boss, did you yeah. view industrial action differently? No, I, when I became director of programmes at London Weekend, I had to undo many of the deals that I'd done as a trade union representative. And I said to the uh, union guys then, look, you know these were ridiculous deals. We all knew they were ridiculous deals, but there was no management. Now you've got some management, we're not going to continue with this. We always tried to pe treat people properly and fairly. But some of the deals that were done in those days in television, as you would know, were ridiculous. Television and newspaper unions weren't like, weren't, didn't fit in, I didn't ever felt, fit into the traditional left-right spectrum. Right, OK, let's, let, let me ask you about your Labour Party activism. When did you join the Labour Party? How old are you when you join? Early 20s. You are an active supporter. You give a huge amount of money to the Labour Party too. Well, I did at a later stage. I was I stood in uh, for the GLC in Putney, where I turned what was quite a good Labour seat into quite a strong Tory seat. You know, in one of those years when there was this massive the Callaghan years when there was a massive swing against. And then I did, as I made money in life, I did give money to the Labour Party for some years. Yeah. Quite a lot of money. I read that it was £50,000, which is a lovely... I would think, goodness me, what what motivates somebody to give such a, a massive amount of money to a political party? Explain your motivation there. Well, I'd made quite a significant amount of money. So you can't just take 50000 It's 50000 out of how much, isn't it? If you've only got 50000 you wouldn't give it all to a political party, would you? If you've made quite a lot, then you might, and you give some. I've continued to give money to political parties, even though I'm not a member. I've, many, I've given money in recent years to the Liberal Party because we lived in a Liberal constituency. I've never been a member of the Liberal Party. In fact, I rejoined the Labour Party just to vote against Corbyn. Oh, did you? Yeah, I rejoined to vote against Corbyn. And when he won again, I resigned again. Who did you vote for in, uh, in that leadership election then? I, I was in the anyone but Corbyn camp. I thought Corbyn so summed up what I'd always known about the left when it tried to infiltrate the Labour Party. Not I think that he was particularly infiltrating the Labour Party, but I think those who were supporting him were. They were the same as the trots I knew at university. And of course, in the end, I presume they're all now leaving the Labour Party, but I haven't seen any figures. So I am guessing that landing the job as the Director General of the BBC is quite a moment. Well, it wasn't. Someone at the BBC found a, a quote from me on a television programme saying that, you know, I didn't think there was any chance. So they, of course, found that and used it, which is fair enough. That's, that's the game. Actually, the fa my favourite job was, was being chief executive of London Weekend Television because it was a great company to be part of. And then we won the GMTV franchise, which I put together. Uh, that, but that was revenge time against Bruce Gingell. But yeah, I mean, getting when you become director general of the BBC, you are, I mean, that's that's a serious job. And of course, I, I got it at a time when William Haig was the leader of the Tory Party, who who didn't want me to get it because I'd given money to the Labour Party, which I think probably helped me get the job, because I think I think the governors of the BBC were going to be told what to do or not by the leader of the Conservative Party. You have famously the most monumental fallout with that Labour government following uh, the claims made by the journalist Andrew Gilligan that the government knowingly lied over the existence of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. You robustly defend uh, the BBC in that battle that Alistair Campbell is clearly uh, coming for. The well, by then, Alistair Campbell hated the BBC. I mean, all governments in the end end up hating the BBC. 
this one, I think the current government probably a bit earlier than most, but they all end up because they all quite like the BBC in opposition because it gives them a voice. And then they don't like the questioning when it goes the other way around. And I, it's only a matter of time before the government of the day and the BBC actually fall out. Now, in terms of Tony Blair, I mean, I think history shows that we were right and Tony Blair was wrong, that they did know or have a good idea that there were no weapons of mass destruction. Uh, they certainly didn't know every evidence that there was. But I mean, this is all 20 years old now. How did it feel to be at war with the party, a war that cost you the biggest job in broadcasting, really? I didn't support, I mean, if you were director general of the BBC, you can't take a political position. Now, some people would tell you that actually that made me more anti-Labour than, than other people. But I thought we tried very hard in our coverage of Iraq, of the Iraq war, to be, for, to be fair. And I don't think at that time, Blair was in real problems with his party. He wrote me what became quite a famous letter in which he basically said the BBC just before, which he put up to it by Alistair Campbell, of course, but in a letter I think he regretted later, basically saying uh, we weren't being impartial. And I wrote back and said, I'm sorry, but you can't be the judge of impartiality. You're in, in a terribly serious situation. Half your party oppose what you're doing. There's millions of people on the streets. We can be the judge of impartiality. You can't be which was perhaps naive, but was right. Would you ever forgive Alastair Campbell? Um, well, whenever I see him, which I do occasionally, he says, we were right, he was right. And I say, when, and, and I say well, there's only you and Tony left believing that. There's no one else. No one, I think, now doubts, you know, 20 years on, that they sexed up the case for war. And that's what the allegation was basically about. But in the end, it was, do I forgive him? Yeah, I don't hold grudges. I've never held grudges. Uh, it, was, it was all part of the experience of life. And, um, you know, you'll remember on the day I left, uh, my staff all took to the streets to protest in very large numbers all over the country. And you think that made it, that made what was a horrible day bearable, really. That changes your political outlook too and your voting. I couldn't vote for the Labour Party in those circumstances. I voted Liberal, partly because I lived in the Liberal con constituency, but mainly because they had, Charlie Kennedy had taken, had the nerve to stand up against the Iraq war. You know, we look back now and, I mean, it destroyed Tony Blair who will never be a polit major political force again, despite the fact that he's got all sorts of talents. And I think it's hard to find anybody today who defends the invasion of Iraq. Now, that wasn't what our argument was at the BBC. It wasn't our job to decide whether it was right or wrong, but it was our job to question some of the things that were going on and that were being said. Greg, it's Tom here. Hi. Can we move on to the politics of football? After you left the BBC, you chaired the FA for four years and you've had long-standing roles with Manchester United and Brentford football clubs. Can I ask, are the politics of football less lethal than the politics of broadcasting? The politics of broadcasting, I didn't find difficult. It was the politics of broadcasting vis-a-vis -vis the government. Well, it's the same difficult. thing, isn't it? Yeah, no, no, no. It's both, whether it's the politics of the institution. The thing about football, I mean, I had been involved for a long time. And, you know, I was involved in the... the I held the dinner at London Weekend Television of the five biggest clubs when they decided to break away and set up the Premier League. Uh, so I've been there for a long time. I didn't, find the, I, I didn't find the politics of football in any way difficult, except you couldn't get things changed because there was a deal done between the Premier League and the old buffers of the FA. And it was very difficult to say, well, actually, we've got a fundamental problem in English football today, and that is because we've got the richest league in the world, mm. it's increasingly owned by, managed by, and played by people from overseas. And that means a lot of very good young kids who come into English football don't get, don't get anywhere. And they should do. And that's that was my major concern. But that's when I tried to get that changed, it was very difficult. Oddly, it could now we've left the EU, it could be changed. 
uh, whether the FA have got the nerve to do it is another matter, but the FA could quite easily say, okay, we're changing the rules so that 50% of your, of your squad have to be British. Leaving the EU would give you what you wanted at the time by allowing the FA to set some quite demanding targets of, of the largely foreign-owned yeah, billionaire-owned clubs. You're no longer bound by the Bosman ruling. And it was all back goes back to the Bosman ruling, which was a classic case of a judge to, taking a decision that he didn't understand because he said, well, this doesn't, isn't, isn't going to mean that there are more and more foreign players playing in individual companies, countries' leagues. So if you but waved your magic wand, what would you like to see happen tomorrow? I would introduce over a stage of, say, five years that Premier League clubs uh, have to have a higher percentage of British players. Where would you put the percentage? I'd probably put it at about 60, 70 percent in the in the 20 odd. I don't know what the number is now, but it's probably 24. But if, at the beginning of the season, you have to name this is our squad for 24. I'd say 60 percent of those have to be British. It wouldn't make British clubs hugely competitive in competitions like uh, the um, Europa when, League or the Champions League, would it? It comes down to whether you whether you're do you care that the whole of your that. You know, you looked at the Chelsea side or the Arsenal side in the in the charity shield it had one English person in it. I think Chelsea had two, you know. Um, uh, and sorry, Liverpool had two. Liverpool, I mean, Manchester United went through a period when I was on the board there, but, but nothing to do with me, when they had a lot of British players, largely because Alex Ferguson promoted from the youth team. Uh, and last season, you suddenly saw that happening. The best youth structure in this country is Chelsea's. And you suddenly saw that happening at Chelsea because they had a ban on bringing in new players from overseas that are imposed by UEFA. This season, they've gone out and bought literally a whole team. So that's not going to last. And what it means is unless you can get your young uh, British players, particularly young English players, if you're in the English FA, playing in the top level, top Champions League, and that's it. you're not going to ever get a great English team. OK, let's talk a bit about uh, the BBC today, then, if you don't mind. Tim Davies' appointment. In an age when the BBC is under ever greater financial pressure, isn't it right that the, the DG's job has gone to a marketing expert rather than someone from a creative background like you have, for example? Well, I'd also had a business background. Um, I always remember when I first got there, the first question I asked is what percentage of our income are we spending on overhead? And it came to a, uh, an incredibly large figure, I think 27% or something. And what I did over four years was get that down to about 15, 16. And I, I, what I mean by overhead, I mean all those bits of the BBC that don't actually produce or broadcast programmes. And that had grown too large. And I that's been reduced over the years. Yes, I mean, marketing is an important part of what the BBC is going to stand for now. But I, oddly, I think he's got the job at quite an interesting time because although you've got a fairly hostile government, what they're going to discover is that a large number of the people who vote Conservative actually are the BBC's strongest supporters. And, and if you look at the world we're now in, we've just come, we're coming, going through COVID where suddenly people turn to, the, and that, which has always been the case, at a time of crisis, that's exactly what's happened over the last three months, four months. And I think the, that puts the BBC in a stronger position. I also don't think this government is that strong to be able to really take on the BBC. I mean, why would you take on the BBC? You, you know, you've got enough problems as it is. Secondly, there's always been a bunch of Conservative MPs who are incredibly supportive of the BBC. And a lot of them are still there. So that if the government does take on the BBC without putting it into, into its manifesto, without, then I think they will stand up in the end. But there's been an acceptance across the board, hasn't there, that the licence fee can't really continue in its current form. It's a bit of a 20th century anachronism. Oh, it's weird. I mean, the idea that you have, that you fund the BBC by charging people for having a television set is weird. But it does mean that it means that the BBC isn't funded by government. It belongs to the people and it's funded by the people. Via the government making it law, or well, certainly for the current time being, that you have to pay yeah, a yeah, tax. Yeah, it's always been law, but I mean, 
that might change, but we don't know yet to what. But I've always thought there must be come a time when the when the license fee doesn't work anymore. However, that's not a reason for not publicly funding funding your broadcasting system. Let me ask you, what do you think of the two-tier approach that's being talked about? So a basic fee for uh, to get BBC programme for news, etc., and then you pay a levy on top if you want sports coverage, match of the day, or high-quality drama. Well, sport is... High-quality drama, I think, is it should be in the first lot. Sport is different because, by and large, people, the money you're spending on sport is going on to sports rights. And my predecessor at the BBC, I think, had take, took the view that that wasn't justified. Um, and in some ways he was right, but the problem was the research we did showed that amongst men, and particularly young men, they were quite aggressive towards the BBC because they'd lost all those sports rights. I'm not sure that that two-tier system will come in to place in the near future. I mean, what is important about the BBC is universality, that everybody can receive it. You know, even if they don't pay the licence fee, they can receive it. And you could go to a subscription service, which I suspect would be financially to the advantage of the BBC. But is it worth it to lose universality? What about the last night of the proms row? I mean, that's dominated for, for weeks, hadn't it? The yeah, yeah, Britannia yeah. Row. Was it a, a, an entirely avoidable banana skin the BBC just shouldn't have stepped on? Or was was yes. there some faith in the argument they were making after a, a long, hot summer of uh, great racial sensitivities? Whether there's a rational argument or not is not the point. The point is you knew it was not something, the battle worth taking on. When I got to the BBC, I worked out that there were certain battles that you didn't want to have. You didn't want to start scrapping any of the orchestras. You messed around with Radio 3 at your peril. You probably messed around with Radio 4 at your peril. There was a part of Britain that loves the last night of the proms, that thinks it's part of our institutional history, in which case, why mess around with it? And I think the new director general took exactly the right decision that week. But I mean, that's what happens in that job. Let me tell you, I always thought about it. You'd be sitting having quite a nice week and your diary looked quite good and you could do some thinking. And then out of nowhere, something became a big issue. Prime Minister must know exactly the same thing. What about the level of salaries that the BBC is still paying? Obviously, there was a big debate about this. Some salaries have gone down. Tim Davies being paid a salary of £525,000 a year, top presenters on a similar whack. Is that really justified in this type of age? Well, I remember when the big issue was about Jonathan Ross. Now, Jonathan Ross didn't get that deal when I was at the BBC, right? What I do know is he was offered more than that to go elsewhere. Now, there was a time when the BBC would have said, yeah, go elsewhere. I think that should be the position of the BBC now. I think you should pay properly, but you can't pay the what, what, what people could get if they went to the free market. OK, let's move on to your politics t- today. Uh, you've backed the Labour Party, backed the Lib Dems, you've funded both, you've driven around for certainly one of them. Where are you today? Where's your vote now? Last election I voted Lib Dem. So Keir Starmer um, hasn't got you back in the fold? At the moment, I'm, I'm looking and thinking... Uh, you know, it's still early days. I mean, I thought the whole anti-Semitic thing was about as dumb an issue as I could believe. But I think the, 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 the real truth is there were always a chunk of the hard left who were anti-Semitic in the sense that they were anti-Jewish business. But where am I today? I'm still that sort of... Um, Left of centre libertarian, I think. Well, this but is a bit of the show where we have to do that job, I'm afraid. We're, we're coming to the end. We, we try yeah. and define everybody we speak to at the end of every personality politics, and you've had a good go at, at trying yourself. So l- let me give you a fuller definition of what I think you are, having listened to your fascinating thinking. I think you're an anti-trot, left of centre libertarian philanthrope. How do you plead? Quite what that means for your politics, I'm not sure. (laughs) (laughs) All our politics are very complicated. That's the beauty of this show. I realised when I made money in life that there was always a contradiction between my politics and having money. So I try to support a lot of things that that need support for that reason. Keir Starmer shouldn't uh, wait for you to open the checkbook for now. Uh, No. We're at the beginning of seeing whether the Labour Party is moving back to its traditional position or not. Greg Dyke, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much.